source of scholarly research and information on ways in which we can promote peace with freedom. As Abraham Lincoln reminded us in his second inaugural address, we must do all which may achieve a just and lasting peace with all nations. We should always remember that peace follows in freedom's path and conflicts erupt when the democratic will of the people is denied. History shows that democratic nations are naturally peaceful non-aggressive. Democracies take up arms only in self-defense. I have always put it in a sentence that people don't start wars, governments do. Fundamental conflicts between freedom and tyranny cannot be papered over by treaties. True peace will always demand clear-eyed, rock-hard realism and an enduring commitment to the values of political and economic freedom that have guided our great nation for more than two centuries. Thus the surest way to strengthen the foundation of peace is to support the growth of democracy and gain full respect for human rights. Supporting the spread of democracy means providing assistance to the brave men and women who today struggle to achieve a free and democratic society and rid their homelands of foreign supported tyrannies. It also means fighting to help overcome the poverty in underdeveloped countries that breeds violence and radicalism. Free market economic policies Policies that are proven effective in spurring growth and prosperity around the globe and play a vital role in building democracy. But above all, it means keeping America's defenses strong and ready. As I intend to tell the nation tonight, a strong national defense for the United States is not only indispensable to arms control, but for the security, freedom, and peace of the entire world. A real and secure peace depends on us on our courage to build it and guard it and pass it on to future generations. George Washington's words were just as true today. To be prepared for war, he said, is one of the most effective means of preserving the peace. American strength is a sheltering arm for peace and freedom in an often dangerous world. And strength is the most persuasive argument we have to convince our adversaries to give up their hostile intentions, to negotiate seriously, and to stop bullying other nations. In the real world, peace through strength must be our motto. As you begin your work for peace in the great American tradition, you have my best wishes and those of the American people. Thank you all for what you're doing today. Mr. President, <coughs> given your long friendship with Ferdinand Marcos, what are your thoughts about playing a role in his fall from power? Of course, I have to say, I'm. We're here for a different purpose today, and I'm not going to take any questions on that. Well, could I ask you, sir, why you opposed the creation of this body? Why did you oppose the creation of this body? When I he said no questions. No questions. 
Nothing you want to tell us about this we, We've not heard from you since all of these events, sir. We've not heard from you since all of these events took place in the Philippines. Chris, the man said no questions. The man made no questions. Don't consider it. Well, give him a chance. But again, please don't say no more. Mr. President, uh, November of last to uh, ninety. 1984 with John Fisher and Scott Thompson who gave you a book called A Strategy of Peace Through Strength. And I'm glad to hear you endorsing it again. <laughs> yes, I do. There have been four wars in my lifetime, and not one of them was caused because we were too strong. Well, now. <clears throat> Mr. President, it is a great privilege and a pleasure for the members of the board to directors of the new United States Institute of Peace to meet with you. Uh, we are great supporters of uh, your strong uh, support for peace with freedom in the world. And the members of this board strongly support that and endorse it. We are very aware that for many years the totalitarian countries of the world have uh, stolen the word peace. And they have twisted it uh, to their own propaganda ends. This board uh, is going to do everything in its power to uh, convey to the American people and to the world the simple truth that it's the democracies that support peace. Indeed, the creation of this board is yet another indication of the strong tradition of the democracies in seeking peace with, uh, in every way that we can. I think you will also find that the members of this board uh, all understand the great importance of maintaining a strong defense and the understanding that deterrence is critical if we are to prevent uh, totalitarian regimes that are bent on aggression and violation of the Charter uh, from starting serious conflicts. <clears throat> that is a, a, a point that is understood uh, and endorsed very strongly by this board and we are strong supporters of your uh, commitment to uh, a strong United States, a strong free world, uh, and uh, we will do our part in the United States Institute of Peace to particularly uh, uh, participate in this campaign of public education to uh, let people know of the contrast between the work of the democracies for peace and the work of the totalitarian countries in many cases to seek deliberately to undo that. Mr. President, we are with you, and uh, it is a great honor and, and pleasure and privilege to be here. Well, thank you very much. I, I just let me say I know that I have. Excuse me, sir. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,
because this will be the last meeting oh, he will be attending oh, this right. in this yeah. yeah. oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because we will hear a good thing. Mr. President, what's this meeting day. all about this morning? Okay. What is this meeting all about this morning? It's just the fact that we like each other so much that we get together. <laughs> 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 Mr. President, even your uh, Republican allies on the Hill say you're going to have to give on defense. How far can you give without uh, endangering national security? Wrong <laughs> meeting. Yeah. Tell us where you bought that suit. Have you got a NASA administrator yet? I'd like to find that. NASA administrator? No, I don't know. The, the friendly press. To make your anniversary a shot to the gut. <laughs> 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 I'm still, yeah, I'm still a fan of Thomas Jefferson, but I begin to question that thing about a free press. <laughs> well, let me just say a few words here first. We've had a number of balls in the air and several tense moments over the last few days, and I just thought it important that we get together to share some of the thinking that went into our Philippines policy and how that translates to the future. There's a real foundation of foreign policy in this country, a true bipartisan effort that led us to where we are today in the Philippines. And each of you gave us the encouragement that we needed to carry out our policy while also exercising restraint. And that true bipartisan cooperation gave us the latitude to pursue the diplomacy that was necessary for a successful outcome. Often in the last few weeks, as we all know, there was a high rise high risk, I should say, of violence in Manila, but the result turned out to be a positive one for the Philippine people. And we couldn't have undertaken our effort in the face of such risk without your support. And our standing together was a clear signal, I think, of our intent to see the matter resolved successfully. And the, let me say that I'm very proud of the team that George and Cap and John put together on the Philippines and that team that led us to success. So right now I'm going to ask George to go into some detail on the situation. Of uh, the council and this is my staff, junior, senior economist as well as support staff. Well, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to meet each one of you and also to express my thanks these last 10 months particularly have been very, very exceptionally helpful from the CEA. And I have heard some stories from him about all that went into the statistical report, or the economic report, I should say, the statisticians who hung around till 3 o'clock in the morning in the offices, and then those junior economists who stayed enough longer that they just spent the night in their offices. I understand we're looking at factoids. But I am grateful. It was a great report, and I think it carried out uh, actually what we've hoped has been the description of the appearance of our administration. And, uh, See, I feel a little kinship to you. 
you know, anymore I can't tell ethnic stories. So I could argue <laughs> that the only stories left more than I can tell are in economics. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what my degree was in. Of course, 25 years after I got that, the, my alma mater had me back and gave me an honorary degree. And that only added to a sense of guilt I had nursed for 25 years because I figured the first one they gave me was honorary. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it is wonderful to see all of you, and believe me, I, I thank you for, for what you've done and, and for that, uh, that report. Mr. President. Can I tell any kind of story? Yes, sir. You <laughs> <laughs> well, the story has the three gentlemen arrived in heaven all at the same time, if you haven't heard this. St. Peter said they were a little crowded, and they only had room for one, and therefore they were going to take the one that probably was the practicer of the oldest profession. Well, the doctor stepped forward and said, I think that's me. He said, we know that God made Adam, and then he made Eve from a rib that took an operation, and I'm a surgeon, and, uh, and before he could move, another one stepped, the second man stepped forward and said, just a minute. He said, before God did all this, all was chaos. And God then worked for six days, making the earth and eliminating the chaos, so he must have been an engineer, and that lets me in. And the third one says, whoops, both of you. I'm an economist. Where do you think he got all that chaos? <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell a brief true story? <laughs> Yesterday, I was in New York uh, giving a speech on Reaganomics, and uh, afterwards, one of the press people came up and said, well, now, just what do you do, uh, Mr. Sprinkle? And I said, well, uh, my essential job is to provide good economic uh, advice to the president. But I said, it's very easy. And it's very easy, first, because he is the first president in our history uh, that has a degree in economics, but much more important, he understands it. And that's uh, why we have enjoyed so much working for you, but you do understand the arguments from that. Well, I appreciate it. Maybe it had something to do with the time I was learning. We, uh, we had a, it was in the very depths of the Great Depression, and uh, we had a professor head of the department there, and he'd give us outside reading. And we'd go to the library, and we'd get that book, and we would read these pages that he had told us to read. And then he delighted after we would finish reporting, having burned the midnight oil, as you did, but to read that book. And then, in those depths of the Depression, he would say, you might be interested to know that the author of that book, on such and such a date, and he would read it, predicted that he saw no reason why stocks should not continue to rise indefinitely. <laughs> uh, I am the uh, proud possessor of a copy of the economic report that you signed for me. But I would like to give you one that all of the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors oh. signed for you. Thank you all very much. I'm very proud to have that. Very pleased to have it. And also, uh, as you may know, there is a custom in CEA uh, to design a shirt model on the economic report. And we thought when you get out to the ranch and have a couple of months sometime, you might be interested in wearing one that says economic report of the president. Hey, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very pleased to have that. Whoops. Now I understand we're going to be able to have some pictures. We can't have a group picture, and there's too many of them. So we're going to do it individually. Thank you, sir. Right. I guess which way does the line come? I was told it would come this way. They would come to you, starting right there. <laughs> if I was still in pictures, we'd print the first one. I <laughs>